After a lifetime of historical and anthropological research, I ask myself once again the questions which from time to time our friends and students ask us. Does all our study teach us anything? Are there any laws to be discovered in these disciplines? Any patterns which help us to understand the past, the present and the future? And perhaps understand it in a systematic way? Is it all a chaos, a confusion, a tale told by idiots signifying nothing? Or are there hidden laws in history and anthropology? The specific spur to think about these things was the decision to try to gather together all that I've thought about and written about over the years in a set of letters in which I tried to explain how our world works to my granddaughter Lily, who's actually seven years old, but I imagined her at about the age of 17, and I was trying to explain to her what I'd found out about the world and help her to understand what lies behind the confusions. This was my hope, but I was caught in a logical contradiction or paradox which I had never until thinking about it again then been able to resolve. This we might call Alexander Pope's dilemma. At the, first, uh, at the start of the first edition of his essay on man, right at the beginning, he wrote the top version that life, as he put it, the line before, is expatiate free or all this scene of man, a mighty maze of walks without a plan. He was a great garden designer, was Pope, among other things. But the, he couldn't see any plan. Someone must have got to him and said, this is rank atheism or something. Because in the second and later editions, which are the more famous ones, he changed it to complete opposite. A mighty maze, exclamation mark, but not without a plan. Which is it? The paradox was also pointed out to me in conversations and writings by Ernest Gellner. He felt that the great shift from what he called agraria to industria could not have happened by accident. It was too great, complex, and organized to have happened by pure chance. Yet it could not have been designed for who was the designer? So I wondered if there was some third state between these two extremes. And I wrote down the following thoughts on this problem, philosophical problem. Those who study the present or the past, historians and comparative analysts, are apparently faced with choosing one or two views, each of which is unacceptable. On the one hand, we may try to seek out laws similar to those in physics, where if A happens, B will always happen. This would allow predictions into the future and give a firmness and purpose to our studies. In the past, there have been many famous thinkers who believed they had found such laws. Unfortunately, we cannot now accept their views. Since Darwin, and probably before that, it has become impossible to believe that history is moving towards a particular end. It is not heading in one direction. There is no purpose, God, behind it, and there are no absolute laws which govern it. There is no predestined conclusion. In other words, there's no way of avoiding the criticisms of Karl Popper, Isaiah Berlin, and many others of what they call historicism, or the theory of historical inevitability. There are no laws of the same predictive value as those to be found in the natural sciences, though even those laws are not absolute, as you know. Hence, when we look at the human record, either over the thousand years of the past or the experience of different cultures today, we cannot expect to find laws similar to the laws of thermodynamics or gravity. So if we reject the idea of immutable and establishable laws, we seem to be forced to conclude that there are no patterns in the past, no lessons to be learned. History or anthropology looks as if the, it is the study of unique, one-off, unrepeated events. We can only describe these and not expect to learn any lessons from, what, from them about what will happen in the future. Yet this second position is equally unsatisfactory. We know from everyday experience that we 
cannot always predict the future, but we can make fairly robust and useful predictions which usually turn out to be roughly accurate. If this were not so, all human actions, all traffic systems, and all of the existence of humans and other animals on Earth would be impossible. It is on the basis of what we have established about human motivation and what we have seen in the pattern of past events that we make endless decisions, big and small. Not only do we in practice have to use the past and our experience of other people to guide our decisions, but on the whole, it works. If all events were unique and there were no repeated patterns, this life would not be possible. So how do we get out of this dilemma? Let's look again at the objections made to the teleological historicist interpretation. The mistake of many of those who are the target of Popper, Berlin or Herbert Butterfield, that is people like Marx, Toynbee or Spengler, who were seeking the laws of development, their complaint is that they were searching for invariant deterministic laws similar to the imagined laws of physics or chemistry. But as many have pointed out, no one has ever found such invariant laws in history or anthropology. Furthermore, because we cannot know what we shall know in the future, all absolute predictions, as Popper points out, are impossible. But what if we relax the, the requirements and instead of talking about laws, talk about likelihoods, probabilities, trends or best of all tendencies? Here there does seem to be a middle ground, which is the one we use in our daily life and gives us both flexibility and some limited predictive power. My attention to this way of thinking was attracted initially, I think, by Lord Acton's famous dictum that power tends to corrupt. Absolute power corrupts absolutely, which goes around in one's head once one's heard it. If Acton had said, power corrupts, absolute power corrupts absolutely, he would patently be wrong. Power does not always corrupt, but usually it tends to do so. And in this phrase we have the difference between a tendency and a law. Once power is absolute, that is to say there is no countervailing force, no other conditions operating on it, we do have a law. It is similar to saying bubonic plague tends to kill people. People dead of bubonic plague do not come alive again. There is a tendency and a law. In other words, we can put forward statements of the kind usually made by economists and others, which have the often unstated caterus paribus, all, thing, all other things being equal, clause in them. The fact that Acton understood this so well made me pay attention to noticing that he seems to have drawn his inspiration from John Stuart Mill. He quotes Mill's inaugural address in one of his uh, writings as follows. And this is Mill. No political conclusions of any value for practice can be arrived at by direct experience. All true political science is, in one sense of the word, a priori, being deduced from the tendencies of things tendencies known either through our personal experience of human nature or as a result of an analysis of the course of history considered as a progressive evolution. Note here that Mill and Acton's belief in the possibility of looking at personal experience and historical events was the way to establish the tendencies of things. These are tendencies if not laws. So what are these tendencies? And is it helpful to establish what they are? There are several valuable passages in Mill's The Logic of the Moral Sciences which expanded this idea. Writing about a new science of ethology, Mill suggested the following. It's often difficult to follow a speak spoken passage quoted at some length. So I've on the handout, if you want to follow it by reading it as well, the first passage is at the top of the handout. <coughs> 
But we must remember that a degree of knowledge far short of the power of actual prediction is often of much practical value. There may be great power of influencing phenomena with a very imperfect knowledge of the causes by which they are in any given instance determined. It is enough that we know that certain means have a certain tendency, and he, un he uh, made that bold, to produce a given effect, and that others have a tendency to frustrate it. When the circumstances of an individual or of a nation are in any considerable degree under our control, we may, by our knowledge of tendencies, be enabled to shape those circumstances in a manner much more favorable to the ends we desire than the shape which they would of themselves assume. This is the limit of our power, but within this limit the power is most, a most important one. He then goes on to give further precision to the idea of tendencies and to provide some illustrations of what he means. And this is the second passage on the sheet. It is, however, as in all cases of complex phenomena, necessary to the exactness of the propositions that they should be hypothetical only and affirm tendencies, not facts. They must not assert that something will, will always or certainly happen, but only that such and such will be the effect of a given cause so far as it operates uncounted. It is a scientific proposition that bodily strength tends to make men courageous, not that it always makes them so, that an interest on one side of a question tends to bias the judgment, not that it invariably does so, that experience tends to give wisdom, not that such is always its effect. These propositions, being assertive only of tendencies, are not the less universally true because the tendencies may be frustrated. Mill then goes on to agree with the philosopher Francis Bacon that these middle level patterns which lie between universal laws of deep physics and the non-generalizable randomness of events are the most useful that we can find. The only way to discover them is to make more studies of the past and present of as many societies and peoples around the world as possible, alongside examining our own personal experience as human beings to work out what patterns we can establish. So Mill and Acton have suggested that there are tendencies which we can establish, and although they do not always happen, they can provide guidance for present and future action. They are different from laws, teleological and determining structures which will predestine our future. They lie between absolute free will and absolute predestination, giving room for chance and randomness, but also for the establishment of limited generalizations about patterns. The contrast between a law and a tendency is excellently illustrated by the work of Thomas Malthus another source for my realization that this may be the way out of the dilemma. I've done a, a great deal of work on Malthus's work over the uh, years and read and reread his first and second editions of the Principles of Population a number of times. And as I'm sure you know, in the first edition, uh, a very short book, he talks about the laws of population which are inevitable laws. They are famous, that the biological urge to procreate will inevitably lead to population doubling in every generation, whereas food resources will grow more slowly, that populations will rapidly outstrip resources, that they will in due course be cut back by deaths caused by war, famine, and disease. Those are the laws to which we are subject in the first edition. Further thought and further facts made him aware that there were exceptions to these laws, for example, in Norway, Switzerland, or England. In other words, the laws did not always operate. So in the revised and greatly expanded edition of 1803, he changed his model to talk of tendencies rather than laws. All else being equal, population would rise very rapidly. But occasionally, it doesn't. For example, pe people may try to control their fertility or control their fertility through late or selective marriage, as they did in England. The language changes from a deterministic, this or that will happen, this is the law, to one which speaks of normally, usually, probably, there are trends and tendencies.
His device was to show that one can establish a powerful predictive pattern, say the law of population or the law of diminishing marginal returns, which he and Ricardo discovered, which um, help us then to look at the exceptions to this predictive tendency. Something may intervene to break the tendency, and that gives you something to look at. I came to believe that this would could well provide the basic structure of the book I was trying to write for my granddaughter. It could, it could set up a number of tensions or dialectics through examination along the lines recommended by Mill, personal experience and a wide survey of past and present civilizations. It might be possible to discover a number of normal tendencies, but these are not laws. There are always exceptions. Another way of seeing the dialectic is like watching the sea when the tide is coming in fast through rocks with tendencies swirling against other tendencies, a metaphor which I take from Tocqueville who described social life in this way. So much of history is a strife of tides and currents, a struggle between different tendencies. The ratio between the number of occasions the tendency fulfills itself or is counterbalanced is not fixed and may alter over time. For example, very strong tendencies which operate in pre-industrial civilizations may weaken with the onset of the industrial process. Some tendencies have almost always occurred in the past. For instance, the Malthusian tendency of population to grow rapidly for short periods, while others have only occasionally been allowed to operate but both are strong tendencies, in the latter case overlain by even stronger tendencies. As I thought further, the obvious fact emerged that the more physical, biological and chemical the processes we are considering, the more likely the tendencies are to be fulfilled, and this is why scientists seem to find laws and we don't. At the extreme, there are tendencies, like the laws of gravity or Boyle's law, which are almost always uniformly true. But they are not always so, as pointed out by Popper and known about to all of us since Heisenberg. Above this natural science level come a number of tendencies which tell us about the human body and its relations to the physical world, which usually, but not always, operate. They're not quite as strong. These are the demographic, ecological, and economic tendencies. For instance, the law of population or of diminishing marginal returns. Then there are a number of tendencies which are social and political. But already with these tendencies, there are so many complex chains of interconnected causes that the tendency is fairly unstable. That is to say, often deflected, only partially worked out, sometimes completely avoided, and indeed it may be reversed for quite long periods. The most unstable or complex of the tendencies lie in the areas to do with human mentality and morality. It is here, including the branches of science, that Popper's objections to predictions become most forceful. As knowledge and the tools of knowledge accumulates, the tendencies change. Hence, while we hope to establish some mental and moral tendencies, these are very often only rough patterns of what very often happens, a rough sketch. These differences have several other correlations or effects. One is that because the demographic economic tendencies are more likely to occur and recur, they are easier to detect than the very complex ones at the social and mental end of the continuum. It required an enormous amount of cross-cultural comparative data and very deep reflection to discover the social, political and mental tendencies, since they were so often overlain. They become, so to speak, more and more subterranean. Only by looking at very long sweeps of history and very widely, comparatively, do they begin to show themselves. On the other hand, 
It's possible to establish an economic tendency, like Malthus and Ricardo's law of diminishing marginal returns, on the basis of quite a limited number of cases in quite a short space of time. A second related effect is that it is much more difficult to prove that social, political and mental tendencies exist. Few would doubt the laws of thermodynamics or even to a considerable extent Malthus's principles of population or some economic and ecological tendencies. The working out of the tendency is so often skewed in the case of political, social, mental and moral tendencies that it will be always be much more open to questioning an argument. Now I've talked at quite a general level and I hope it's been fairly clear and fairly self-evident and obvious what I've been saying. But I thought that I ought to give you some examples of what I'm, I think I've got, uh, I've discovered. I ought to say that I'm standing on the back of giants. Most of, almost everything that I've found as a tendency has been um, uh, distilled from the work of great theorists who I admire, starting at Montesquieu and Montaigne onwards to Ernest Gellner and others. So these are not my own discoveries, but they seem to hold some weight. This, ref you, if you want to refer to the bottom half of the, of the sheet of the handout, the book here consists of 30 letters to my granddaughter. And um, the one, ones which are highlight, highlight uh, or bold are the ones where I'll give you an example. Um, so, in fact, the first one I'm starting, I start, in fact, I've worked in the reverse order, so the, the one I start with is why are we diseased, which is a biological problem and therefore much firmer. And I'll start with the firmer ones in that way. So starting with biology, what can you say? Here we have the disease tendency, or one of the disease tendencies. This is the tendency of bacteria and viruses to develop faster than larger animals and to increase in number and variety with human wealth and crowding. That means that all else being equal, humans will become sicker and sicker through history, and they often do. But knowing that tendency that crowding cities and so on throughout history have always led to the rise of various kinds of disease, there it creates a puzzle. How was it that in the 18th century this tendency was reversed for the first time in history in England and Japan and one or two other places about which I wrote a book? So I was puzzled by the break in this tendency, which also puzzled Malthus. He had some very good theories as to why it had happened. That's a fairly biological tendency. Then in the intersection of biology and economics, you have the next question, why do so many people starve? The normal tendency in history is for the incidence of serious famines to increase as human populations grow in numbers. There are a number of obvious reasons for this. For instance, you tend to move away from lot growing lots of different kinds of crops to monoculture. Um, you have the subsplitting of holdings, all sorts of things that Malthus and others have talked about through the ages. So if you look and observe great civilizations, famines occur more and more through time. And that, that again poses a question, how was it for the first time in human history really that from about the 18th century the world began to escape, or most of the world began to escape from the tendency towards increased famine? Moving on to the area where economics and society overlap, um, and this is the question, why do many people work so hard? You have a tendency towards what the Japanese economic historian Akira Hayami calls industriousness. He contrasts industriousness and industrialization. And he observed, and many who have looked at civilizations have observed, that as they progress, they usually move towards an increasing burden on humans. 
at the human back and the bo human body as slavery or domestic pressures lead people to have to work more and more hours and harder and harder work, more industriousness. He noticed this in relation to Japan and you can find it in relation to the history of Europe, you can find it in the hi history of China. I've seen it in the, the history of the village in which I worked in the Himalayas in Nepal where I first went there in 1968. There were a lot of animals and um, they took a lot of the strain and they provided better meat and milk for the population. By the time we last visited in 2001, the animals had more or less disappeared and people were having to work much, much harder on a much worse diet. This is the normal tendency. Alternative sources of power such as wind, water and particularly animals are increasingly found to be too expensive to use, which is how the villagers explained it. They couldn't afford to keep an ox. They had to do it themselves. And this is the story of much of the world until the 18th century. But suddenly, something happened and we moved towards industrialization, rather industriousness. How did that occur? Moving on to another sort of socio-economic tendency is the question, why is there inequality? There is a general tendency for civilization to grow increasingly unequal. It's difficult for us perhaps to imagine that in, from our recent experience because there, as Tocqueville pointed out, there was a great sort of shift in the late 18th century towards another kind of world. But he, among others, observed that this is what normally happens. That is the movement towards caste or birth-based hierarchies grow. Normally, as wealth accumulates, it tends to increase stratification and hierarchy. It's, of course, happening in America now, but it's happened again and again in civilizations. So it nearly always happens. More money, more stratification, more wealth, more technology, all these things. Yet, as he observed, and that was the core of some of his best work, there are exceptions. The English and American experiences took them in another direction towards a world with a premise of equality rather than inequality. Why did this happen? If we move towards the intersection of these economic and other matters with power and politics, we're beginning to get to the area where it's a bit more complex. Um, the first of the two that I'll address is, what is bureaucracy for? A question which many of us ask ourselves from time to time. Um, <coughs> as wealth accumulates, numbers of people increase and communication technologies improve. Bureaucracies almost always become stronger and stronger. You don't have to look at the history of any civilization for long to notice this happening, whether it's Rome, um, China, Japan, or current Britain and America. Um, why does this happen? Well, there are a number of reasons which are being given. Some of them reasons have been famously outlined by the great analyst of bureaucracies, F. Northcott Parkinson, of Parkinson's law, um, such as the, the famous fact that um, all bureaucrats need bureaucrats below them to establish their power system. So as soon as you appoint a bureaucrat, they will be working actively to have further bureaucrats down the chain below them and so on. That's just one of the many pressures towards bureaucracy. Um, and you can understand it on the work basis of the work of Tocqueville, which a lot of which is about this bureaucratic centralization of Europe through the, the centuries, or the work of Max Weber on rationalization. And that is a very, very strong tendency towards bureaucratization. Yet for brief periods, this tendency for bureaucracy to expand the fill, to fill the space available has been reversed. Decentralization and non-bureaucratization has triumphed. Weber, of course, built us into the models of the sudden eruptions and the charismatic moments and so on and so on. But there are other ways in which this can happen. But why does it happen occasionally against the natural tendency? Then moving on to where does freedom come from, the next question. The normal tendency, as all the great political philosophers observed, is towards centralized power. As governments become more powerful, they destroy all intermediary and semi-autonomous institutions. 
these in the form of corporations had been licensed by the state in the time of its weakness but once it's strong enough it takes back their power in Maitland's famous metaphor the, the state breathes life into the inanimate dust around it and they, it becomes a body but once you breathe power you can take, take the breath back again and the best account of how this happens and the way of the escape from this tendency is by that great great political philosopher and incidentally legal historian F.W. Maitland. He showed how this tendency was reversed in England and the growth towards what we now call civil society occurred against the tendency. This he thought occurred through the development of the trust idea. The underpinnings of a balanced political and social system were developed upon which you could build democracy. Without yet you can't have democracy. So there's the tendency and the exception. Then on the borderline of these, where they intersect with ideology and religion, we can notice two more examples. I have a custom in Cambridge, which I'll mention to you, since I get so much positive feedback from my students. Years ago when I was at the LSC, I went to a lecture by a social psychologist, and he said, we've done a lot of research on on uh, lecturer psychology. We discovered that the human attention span is about 40 minutes. After that, it's pure waste of space, is what you say. Um, the last 20 minutes of a lecture, uh, hardly anything goes in at all. Um, so he used to show us a film after 40 minutes. Um, what I do is what I'm doing now, which is to stop after about 40 minutes and just ramble so that I can relax you can relax um, and uh, just refresh yourselves and you know stretch and so on. Sometimes I take small questions. I tell them not to ask me what the meaning of life is, but if, if I've said some name, they can't write down to ask me. But I won't consult you that bit. But basically, this is the rest before we go into the last straight of the lecture. Okay. So have we all gathered our strength again at that point? <coughs> I, I hardly get any praise for my lectures, but for that one thing, they say, can't you tell the other lecturers to do what you do? So, I pass it on. Um, so, on the borderline of these is the, and the intersection with the ideology and religion, we can example, uh, we can see some more, two more examples. The first is um, the question what, um, it's a further up actually, it's right up at the top. What is war and why do we fight? Um, the tendency towards predatory warfare, all kinds of warfare, is very deeply built into human societies. Not all societies fight all the time, but there is an awful lot of fighting. After sex and food, it's probably the, the major occupation of human beings, as you may have noticed. And like bureaucracy, war expands to fill the resources available. It's spurred on by many of the combined reasons of greed and fear which Machiavelli outlined. And it has all sorts of impelling propulsions of a kind which you can see regularly recurring through history. One of these is what I call the reverse domino effect. You remember in the Vietnam War and so on, the domino effect was that communism would take over one country and then it would take over the next country. The reverse of that looked from our point of view is that the dominoes go that way rather than coming this way. So if you're at the center of expansion, you knock down a domino and then there's another domino to be knocked down. And that's because the tendency of empires is to find that there are always barbarians on their borders who threaten them and who must, they must try to conquer. Once one domino is down, the next must be knocked down. I won't insult you by drawing allusions to any axes of evil, but you know the scenario, if Iraq goes fine, what the next place would be. So Montesquieu, who gives ample documentation of this effect in relation to the collapse of the Roman Empire, showed how it needed constantly to expand its borders until it imploded. The British Empire is another very good example. I was 
part of this effect. I was born and brought up in Assam, and the British took over India reluctantly, so they said, and then they had to take over Assam, and having taken over Assam, they had to take over the hills around Assam, they had to take over Burma, and then they had to take over. And so it went on until they finally stopped at Japan, couldn't get any further. So this expansion of empires is a very old pattern. A second um, uh, tendency is um, the one which is the question, who are the terrorists? The second tendency f is for civilizations to create inner enemies. Over the last 800 years in Europe, the roll call of those who have been accused of a conspiracy of hatred against our civilization include, you know them, Jews, heretics, witches, communists, satanic cult members, and now terrorists. The tendency is for people to fear them, then to decide that the only way to combat them is to tear up the normal legal procedures in the emergency situation as they did with heretics, Jews, and so on and so on. After the panic is over, as in the witchcraft craze which I um, looked at in some detail, after the panic is over, it's always been discovered that it was largely the reaction to fear which caused the phenomenon in the first place. And sometimes there weren't, well, there was nothing there at all. Sometimes it was much smaller than had been feared, but the, the changing of the legal procedures had generated the thing that you were in terror of. Finally, two tendencies on the borderline between technology and thought. The first is, um, how do we learn? The question, how do we learn? Most of my tendencies have been rather negative, and this is a positive tendency. This is what my co-author and dear friend, um, recently deceased, Je Jerry Martin, uh, called the idea, and this was his idea, the idea of the tri triangle of technological development, which you would expect to have led to a much faster growth of human civilizations and technologies than has, in fact, happened. This triangle has at the top um, that there is a growth of reliable knowledge about the world, i.e. science in shorthand, or discovery. You discover some new general principles about how the world works. This is then embedded in a new set of artifacts or technology based on this new knowledge. Glass is the example we gave in our joint book on this. You find out some principles of chemistry and physics and so on, and then you make better glass instruments. These glass instruments are then uh, multiplied in huge profusion, uh, like <laughs> lenses for, for glasses, and that leads into microscopes and telescopes, which then goes back up into the top, and you discover new things with the microscopes and telescopes. So you go around this triangle, and much of human history can be seen as the speed at which you go around that triangle. This tendency could lead to very rapid growth of human knowledge, but nearly always something stops it. One of the things that stops it is the answer to the next question, how does information destroy knowledge? Because this is a, a, a negative tendency which is very, very widespread. That is that as the technologies of communication, writing, printing and so on, become more powerful, rather than leading to greater knowledge and greater innovation, they usually lead to greater thought control, conservatism, and suppression of new thought, as in later, the later history of China or Islam. But if very occasionally, as in Western Europe from the 12th century, the tendency seems for a time to be overcome. So you wonder what the conditions for the escape from this normal tendency might be. These are very brief examples what, of what I have in mind. Nearly all of them were developed out of a kind of mental triangulation. I've drawn, as Mill suggested, on my own life experiences, both as a private individual and as an anthropologist. I've tried to compare civilizations as widely as possible, and that's why I travel around and move from the Himalayas to Japan, China, and so on. Um, and I try to do this both by travel and reading about as many places and experiences as I can, and also by looking backwards in time, quite long periods, a thousand years or so at least, 
and also by changing the depth of focus. Um, my wife Sarah at the back and I have done a, the most detailed study of an English village, for instance, it's the, uh, all the documents of an English village. Um, so I'm interested in the micro and one village in the Himalayas, and one person in that village. But moving up to the general and up and down is Mark Bloch recommended we should do. So by doing these sorts of activities, um, I've tried to see what these often confused and concealed tendencies might be. Because you seem to have to synthesize them out of a large amount of data, something akin to extracting radium from tar. And that this is why I think a short cut is to stand on the shoulders of, of great men, which is what I've done, because I find that many of them have found these tendencies and written about them. Wide, broad polymaths, Montesquieu, Adam Smith, Malthus, Topfield, Maitland, Max Weber, uh, who, uh, all of whom I've tried to study and write about, and before them even Caldoun, Montaigne and the Greeks. They all have glimpses of these and often write them down very clearly. The, the important, one of the important things though is to maintain the distinction between law and tendency, because if you don't you end up by doing all this sort of activity and ending up like Marx, Spengler and others in saying that you've discovered not just tendencies but laws. This is how it has happened, is happening and will happen. And you end up in the dangers that Berlin and others have pointed out. So that's one danger in one direction. On the other hand, if we stray too far in the other direction, as in the work of some postmodernists or earlier writers such as A.J.P. Taylor, the historian, then you end up in the position, for instance, of Simon Sharma, the historian and television presenter, who writes at the start of his history of England that the only thing which an academic can uh, uh, do or uh, is to be uh, or can be is a storyteller. Basically, it's just a story. We just tell tales to each other. So I think this middle way, as Tony Giddens would probably say, this middle way, or there, gives us hope for um, finding an alternative to the pessimistic view that we can learn nothing from any of the social sciences. The world, I think, is indeed a mighty maze, but I agree with the second edition of Pope. It's not without a plan, except that it's not planned by a great gardener in the sky. Um, it isn't that we can only describe, never prescribed or predict. It's not that we are on a darkling plain where confused armies fight by night. We can teach our grandchildren something and give them some guidance and some cheer. One other advantage of this tendency approach is that it protects us against something which all of you as anthropologists in particular have faced many times in your careers. The fact that every generalization which we make can be re refuted by an exception. As Popper observed, science proceeds not by providing thi proving things true, but having in place theories which had not yet been shown to be untrue. That's fine for science because it's often very difficult to disprove a theory because it's nearly always right. So it proceeds quite well by that procedure. But if you apply that to the social sciences, it leaves us almost with no statement approaching a generalization. There's always someone in an audience ready to remind us that this or that pattern we think we've seen is not true among whoever they happen to have worked with. We seem to be reduced to pure description of individual non-generalizable cases, a point made some years ago in a famous article by Evans Pritchard. Yet with the idea of tendencies, we can make partial generalizations all power tends to corrupt. Bureaucra bureaucracies tend to grow. Inequalities tend to grow greater, and so on. The exceptions to these are not refutations, but interesting qualifications which help us to understand the conditions which lie behind the tendencies and to refine our models. When does power not corrupt or bureaucracy not expand? To conclude, 
I've only skipped a few of the tendencies I try to explain in my letters to my granddaughter, nor have I had time to explain how the tendencies were occasionally avoided, except in the case of Maitland's idea about trusts very briefly. The exceptions and the reasons for the exceptions are in many ways even more interesting than the tendencies. But I hope I have shown a possible way out of a dilemma which I certainly faced through much of my academic career. Most people in the past and many in the present believe that the way in which things develop through time is laid down by God or the gods. God is a master craftsman, artist or mechanic who designs an elaborate system. People argue that all this present complexity cannot be the result of pure accident, as Ernest said to me on several occasions. Thus, you easily leap into the belief that there must be a purpose behind it. If you believe that, then it solves many puzzles and it makes it easier to accept apparent chaos. But personally, I cannot see evidence for a human-like force behind creation though I do accept the extraordinary degree of orderliness in our world. It seems to me likely that this is the result of basic biological and physical laws operating over millions of years. These lead to constant small variations, those that work that improve the chances for the survival of plants and animals, including human animals, are retained, as Campbell put it, blind variation selective retention. Add to this the nature of human beings, with their conscious experimentation, their cultural memory and desire to improve their world, and their ability to make a large hash of it in their attempts. And it's possible to account for how our world could have reached this point. In all of this, there are many accidents. The shape of Cleopatra's nose, the wind that destroyed Kublai Khan's fleet off Japan, or the career of Napoleon they have changed the world. On the other hand, there are deep forces and laws, the laws of population, economics and politics, which I have alluded to, which also operate alongside these one-off events. So we can see a mixture of chance, unintended consequences and comprehensible and more general laws. And this is the general philosophical position of people like Montesquieu and Tocqueville. So I do believe that there are deeper, deeper tides below the surface of history. Beneath the daily events, there are a number of continuing structures and strong tendencies. To change the metaphor, there are paths along which civilizations move and through, and though there is room for straying, they are under some compulsion to stick to the path. These tendencies and paths are determined by physical, biological, economic, political, and social forces. They constrain our lives in the same way that language constrains, but does not absolutely determine what we can think and say. The best way to harness their power is to understand what they are. In knowledge is freedom. When the fly realizes it is trapped in the fly bottle, it has established some freedom. It may even find the exit from the jar. So although every methodology has its costs, I do find the idea of a middle level between law and randomness attractive. By approaching history and anthropology in this way, we escape the criticisms of historicism, teleology, and historical inevitability. Equally, we escape the despair and patent nonsense from our own experience of a view of events as totally random and without discernible pattern or meaning. As in our everyday lives, we look for patterns in the past and present, but not ones that operate uniformly and without variation. I had an example as I was walking here today. Uh, I crossed the road with one of you, um, probably Sarah, and I said, and it was Ernestine, and I said, uh, I thought it was dangerous to cross the road because uh, cars don't usually stop you. And she said, well, they usually do, but not always. So um, that was an example of a tendency and a prediction on which you might risk your life. The approach I'm trying to suggest uh, sets up models of what we might expect to find and thus directs our attention to exceptions. That seems a good logic for the study of history and anthropology, combining an attempt to learn something from the past, both from the normal cases and from the exceptions.
Thank you very much.